love it. You know, you've been in the game for a really, really long time. Maybe for some people who might not know a little bit about you and what, maybe you can let them know like a little bit about yourself. Well, you know, I've been involved with uh, mixed martial arts as a referee for, oh gosh, for, well, for the last uh, maybe 12, 13, maybe, I don't know, 14 years perhaps, I, I, somewhere around that time. Yeah. And I've uh, been pretty actively involved in, in doing the amateur fights, uh, mid-level shows, the local sh regional shows in California, and obviously uh, um, some of the bigger shows that, uh, that are out there, UFC, Bellator, and, and uh, um, events like that. So I've been, been pretty active lately. Yeah, man. I, well, I definitely know you were busy because the last time I even was out in L.A., you had like a you had the Bellator like literally the next day after we had lunch. So busy yeah. Dude. Yeah. now you train jujitsu yeah. as well, which is something yeah. I really wasn't aware of until we started chit chatting, which is pretty cool. How long have you been training jujitsu? I've been involved with jujitsu for since 2002. So oh, shit. you've been training for a while, been training for a while, you know, and uh, um need to getting back into it a little bit more consistently now that my son's wrestling's over with and, and, uh, so much of, uh, my attention has been drawn towards him and getting him ready through state and here in California and, and, uh, obviously injuries and stuff like that in life itself. But, uh, yeah, something that, uh, now I have, I have really nothing to hold me back now that that's, that part of it is done was, was focusing on my son and intermittently I train here and there, but I can be more consistent now. Yeah, that's cool. Well, I mean, especially with like your schedule, I'm sure that that makes it fairly difficult for you to be able to train if you're like, although luckily a perk of training, a perk of traveling is you get to train at different gyms, which is pretty much what I do. Uh, you know, I travel somewhere. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to train over there. <laughs> like, I don't even know these people, but um, you know, what's, what made you start in the martial arts? I mean, obviously, you know, to be able to get to a position where you're at now, you know, like there's got to be some type of a path you know, something that led you to be able to go down the path of being a full-time referee and stuff like that. So maybe you can kind of guide us a little bit through what kind of got you into the business. Well, absolutely. You know what, uh, a, a real big, uh, influence in, in my life as far as officiating goes and, and I wouldn't be here where I'm at today. And, and that's, that's just being real. You, you, you and I have talked about this before is, uh, is the influence of big John McCarthy. You know, he's definitely bar none who's, who's, um, really took me under his wing and I, it, and I've had big John school me from the beginning. So he was, I got into training and, and, uh, used to go to a lot of the regional shows and, and check out the local shows. And, and I says, well, you know, I can, I can see myself doing that. My jujitsu coach, which was John Iwano. Uh, he's the one that made the, the first UFC glove was my jujitsu coach. He's a black belt under, um, Carlson Gracie and mm -hmm. under Rodrigo Medeiros and Carlson Gracie. And so, he was my, he was my, uh, my jujitsu coach. And he goes, Hey, I know a guy named, you know, big John McCarthy. You might've heard of him. And I says, yeah, yeah, I think I know who he is. Yeah. You know what? I'll, I'll put you in contact with him. And, uh, I chopped it up with John and just listened to everything he told me to do and what not to do and how to go about doing it and continue training. And the rest is history, you know, and here I am today. And, um, you know, big John has no doubt been a very big influence along with, you know, Herb Dean, uh, who's a good friend of mine as well. You know, we've also trained together. Um, Jason Herzog, guys like that who, who have been uh, very instrumental and been close bros. And, you know, and then from there, it's the rest is history. You just develop relationships with everybody else. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a hard job. But we talked about this. I would never want your job. It is a highly, highly stressful job. A lot of times the decisions that are made, you know, obviously you're going to do the best that you can, but in the heat of the moment can be a difficult decision that really will affect someone's career path, you know, like uh, early stoppages or um, a bad call or a mistake. Like I, I would never want to be put in that position, but you constantly put yourself in those positions. Recently, you were just uh, like the Fedor fight. You had front row seats to that. Now for that type of job, like especially where it ends in a knockout and stuff like that, you literally are a part of history. Like you, you might not be the fighters in the ring, but you, you are a decision maker in the history of what's going to happen with certain fights. Like, what do you think has been the best uh, fights that you've officiated? What are your favorite ones? Well, you know, what's funny is that I, I've, I've been asked that question. You've asked me that before. And we've talked yeah. about that when we we're having Peruvian food in LA. Remember? So yeah, <laughs> um, delicious, by the way, shit's so good. Dude, wasn't that awesome? <laughs> I know. I'm telling you, man. I tell. I keep telling Kenny Florian he's got to go oh. there, bro. It's 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 all yeah, insane. Um, you know what? Some of the best fights, Rob, 
are the fights that were never seen on TV and, and, and weren't uh, on, on big stages, you know, or some of the regional shows have some amazing fights um, that I could tell you who the names are. You know, you're like, man, dude, I, I don't know who the fuck that is, you know, but they're, they're up and coming fighters, but they show true grit and amazing, amazing performances, the way they fight and everything else. But as far as big level, uh, big name fights, um, the one that always stood out to me and, and was very significant for me was, you know, I love both guys and they're, they're amazing athletes as uh, Nate Diaz and, uh, Josh Thompson. Uh, that fight was, was pretty spectacular. Cause I was that, uh, as I stopped it, uh, Nick threw the towel in to, you know, stop the fight. And just like the, any, any of the two Diaz brothers or anybody that comes out of that camp, those guys don't quit, man. They're, they're, they're relentless. They're tough. And, you know, Nate Diaz was like, oh, man, I'm still in it, you know, and he's, he was rocked pretty bad. But yeah. those are the decisions you have to make. So sometimes you got to protect fighters from for themselves. And, uh, um, and that can be hard, you know, and that's that's the experience and making that right judgment call. And we don't always get it right. You know, it, we, yeah. we, we, we're human and we make mistakes. But that was one that stood out significantly that, that was pretty amazing. But, um, man, refereeing Fedor, bro. That oh, was, that was, I told Big John, I told John that I go, dude. That's I. I was honestly, bro. I was in, I was like, wow. I'm 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 with Fedor, you know. Yeah. I'm in the Incredible, cage right? with Fedor, man. And uh, um, him and Frank Mir was a was an amazing fight. And uh, you know, he caught Frank, you know. And you know, there's going to be winners, there's going to be losers, you know. And uh, to me, they're both studs and winners, and and they're 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 icons in the sport, but. Um, Fedor was somebody that to me was, wow, that was impressive, man. That was awesome. So yeah, that, that, um, that, that was, that was, that was something special, man. That was pretty cool. Yeah. That was like at the last Fedor fight. Um, who did you fight? Ryan Bader. Ryan right. Bader. Bader. And, uh, there were some great, great, great pictures, man, of you in the ring. And of course it's, it is always it always does suck to see a legend fall like that. I can, no matter who you are, like you know, somebody said that you're their favorite referee. <laughs> um, it always does suck suck that whenever you see a legend fall like that because you know you always want these guys to go out on top. But every fighter's got to lose, especially towards the end of your career. Like as a matter of fact, I think that Brendan Schaub hit it on the head the other day when he was talking about um, Israel versus uh, Anderson Silva. And he was talking about the best thing that could have possibly happened for Anderson. So, although that fight was great. My hands were sweaty the whole time because uh, those guys are tacticians. But the best thing you could really do as a fighter, as a legendary fighter, is to go out on your shield. It's to catch like the ultimate ass whooping knockout. So that way there's no second thoughts in your head about quitting. You know, you, it's like a period at the end of the sentence. You pass the torch, you know, and you get the opportunity to watch those torches being passed. It's it's pretty incredible things. You get you get the best damn seats in the house every time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a working seat, but it's it's a you know I hear that all the time. But we're working and it's a job, and uh, um, we're all in different frequencies. You know, I'm we're I am I'm focused. I'm I'm focused on what I need to do, and I have these two amazing athletes. Um, you know, and 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 trying to kill each other. You know, and they're 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 trying to win. Um, trying to improve their quality of life um, and, uh, and and move onward and upward. And my job is to protect them, but I have to let them fight. And I have to, mm -hmm. there has to be conclusion. There has to be a decision rendered. And it's got to be a fair decision on both sides. And, and to make that call is, it's, it's, it's a privilege and honor to be there. And so as long as I stay healthy and, and uh, God willing, just continue doing what I'm doing and stay on the right path, I'll, I'll, I'll be here for as long as I can. So as long as I'm healthy enough to continue to do my job at a hundred percent, you know, yeah. has the UFC ever contacted you about being in the hall of fame? No, they don't, they don't No, not at all. No, that's no. a shame. No. That's a damn shame. Cause you know, like I said, referees, you have such a difficult job. Like, I don't really think people understand the type of pressure because everybody can look back. Like for instance, you know, I'll, I'll I'm not going to drop names or, or, or anything like that because I know that you probably know uh, pretty much every referee in the game. But um, there are definitely some referees who have made some calls that you just look at and you go, fuck, man, come on. Like, But then again, when you're in the heat of the moment, like I couldn't possibly be able to understand that type of pressure. But then when you're looking like and they're, they're, I think the worst ones aren't necessarily the ones that are stopped short because at the very least, they're still safe. I think the worst ones are the ones that don't get stopped in time. 
those are the scary ones. Like, uh, who was it? The uh, damn, uh, not Nate Corey. Uh, I don't know. One one of the fighters basically got to a mounted position. A uh, guy was rolled over onto his belly, and he was just raining down bombs on top of him. And it felt like forever. Probably a good solid 15, 20 seconds after it probably should have been stopped. And uh, the guy's not intelligent to defend himself, and it just seemed like the referee was just staring at the fight happening. Like, that's cool. And everybody, like, is pretty much at this point yelling, like, please, like, stop the right. fucking fight. You know, um, have you ever had, like, a, a situation where you as a referee from the outside have seen another referee and go, fuck, man, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah, it's happened. It's happened. You know, it's, it's you know, that's when, um, you know, you can't be thin-skinned in this sport. And, and like I said, uh, um, I've been fortunate enough to be around Big John, who schooled, you know, all, me and Jason, and we were around him a whole lot. And we also had Herb as well, because we, Herb is in California. So we were fortunate enough to have been schooled, you know, by John and, and even Herb telling us, hey, this is what's up. Um, and, uh, when to stop it, when not to, and, and you can't be thin skinned, man. You know, we're, we're, you gotta, you gotta be able to take it and, 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 um, you know, when we drop the ball or do something like that, definitely, you know, you're, you're going to hear there's backlash, there's repercussions for your actions, man. So, um, you know, people's lives are at stake, you know, that's, that one blow could stop that fighter from continuing to fight for the rest of his life because of your, you know, decision making your judgment so yeah you know it's it's we do get backlash and we do hear it and i've been there and i've seen it i've also talked to other referees um you know that 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 i've helped out through their careers as well as to the do's and don'ts but hey man it happens it, it's it's yeah. unfortunate um you know but um sometimes it, it it's an unfortunate side of humanity it sucks sometimes our judgment isn't always there it isn't 2020 as to what eight or 10 different camera angles are depicting. <laughs> yeah, no shit. That's another thing too. I think people miss like anytime we usually. Hey, you there, Rob? You're breaking up. Yeah, I'm still here. Sorry. Go ahead. My, uh, I didn't hear you at my all. My Wi-Fi must have kicked out there for a second. Um, <laughs> That sucks. But yeah, like usually when you see fighters from the camera angle, you catch the side view and the referee is on the back end of that because we don't want to stare at the referee's ass. Right. So, uh, yeah, no one wants to see that. So like but we see that angle. You, I think people forget the referee is not seeing what we are seeing. The referee is seeing the back end of that. The referee is seeing another side of that. No matter how close you get, like I can't tell you this is probably one of the, the biggest ones I've seen. As I can't tell you how many times I've seen people get knocked unconscious, uh, choked out with a Von Flu choke because it looks so much just like side control that when the person's out, it's unless you were like right there, you could not possibly see this person's unconscious. You know? Well, you know what, Rob, number one, if the referee should acknowledge what that choke is and what the setup is. OK, that's 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 inexcusable. You should know what yeah. you're looking at. You should know the setup. You know what's open. If you do train, you know, it's coming. You know, if you got a guillotine, you know what's going to come, the defense and, and or, or a submission coming from that and, and where the placement of the shoulder is and everything else. So, no, shame on that referee. He should know where it's at. That's yeah. So um, that to me is inexcusable. Um, yeah, I if saw. You don't, if, if you don't know Von Flew and you don't know where it's coming, then you probably shouldn't be there. So yeah, it, I disagree with that. Man, I was at a – what what promotion was it? I forget. There, there was a promotion that came through to Jacksonville, Florida, right? Mm -hmm. Guy was pressed up against the cage. Guy who was pressing guy up against the cage, Von flew him. The guy up against the cage goes to sleep because it's it's a it's a pretty nasty choke, man. That shoulder pressure on that neck, you go out, right? Yeah. And he was out for a long time. And I mean, people were literally screaming. And I mean, this is a big auditorium. People are screaming at the referee. He's out. He's out. And the referee like still was taking a second. It's like, fuck, this dude's gonna die in this goddamn ring because this guy's staring off into space. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it, it it has it has happened. It's it's caught some um, younger officials, um, you know, blindsided and 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 if you don't recognize, that's what I'm saying. The recognition and the setup is important. Um, mm -hmm. And and uh, you know, hopefully that fighter didn't have um, irreversible damage or whatever. You know, hopefully he was he was safe. But yeah. it does happen, and 
Uh, I've seen it happen with other officials and not to say that they're horrible or they suck. It's just that they had a bad moment and I, yeah. bet, you, I bet you they won't do that again. No, I have to imagine that getting reamed out for something like that has got to suck. <laughs> it's got to suck. It does. It does. But you got it coming, bro. So how else are you going to learn? You know, we're, you can't always get pats on the back and told you're bitching. When in reality, <laughs> you know, you fucked up. So you got to keep it real, dude. You know, well, I mean, that's important. Like, yeah. it's a, it's, you're in a, 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 a sport where people literally are trying to hurt each other with their hands. So a little slap on the wrist and getting reamed out isn't shit. You know, at least the, especially when it comes to people's safety, like you should get reamed out if you fuck up with somebody's safety, you know? Yeah, uh, I agree. I you're agree. getting, uh, I've been on the receiving end of that several times. John was nothing nice with any of us, but I've been called every name in the book and, and, and it, by, by big John, you know, and, uh, uh, love him to death. He's, he's like a, you know, big brother to me and we're, we're, we're cool and I love his family. But, uh, when it comes down to work and performance, uh, we set that aside and we set those differences aside and and trust me, I I go to him and I still go to all the other officials, whether they're junior or senior. I'll ask him, hey, man, was that a good call? I'm not above or beneath anybody for constructive criticism, because if you are, then you got a problem with yourself and you need to get over that shit, because how else are you going to get better if you don't talk to your peers mm, and, yeah. and, and acknowledgement? And, and they may have seen something you haven't seen or you mm. didn't see. How is he going to get better? That's crap. Yeah, for sure. Now, some people are asking some questions here. So I'm just going to start an, uh, asking you some of the stuff they're asking. So let's see here. I said, how long did it take you to grow your beard and or mass mustache? And which one is it? It's a mustache and it's been over 12 years. Holy shit. 12 yeah. years. And yeah. you haven't like ever cut it, trimmed it. I did, dude. I told you my, uh, I, I've cut it. I've cut about uh, two feet off already in 12 years. Two feet. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Wow, it's like another person hanging off your beard. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell you, if I had a full head of hair, dude, I wouldn't have this shit. I already told you that. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's another question. I normally wouldn't po toss this kind of question up, but I think that you'd probably be funny with it. Uh, are the, those braids are perfect for choking a man to death? Have you ever tried to choke someone with your braids? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You were talking gi or no gi? <laughs> gi, brother, gi. With the gi and no gi. You know. <laughs> Sneak it over there. Oh, dude, you guys like a baseball choke. <laughs> <laughs> Boss it over and fucking. <laughs> that's great. Sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you were definitely Dan. He said you were uh, one of his favorite referees. That's awesome. Also, have to say, I one of mine, I really do appreciate it. I think you're a good official. Um, so, uh, you, you know. Awesome. Dominic said that, uh, you know, you were also a dope referee. Agreed. There's only a couple referees that I really think, like, when I see them in the ring, like, you know that those are the guys that deserve title fights, you know, like as referees. There's only a few, a very select few, because some decisions are really hard to make on the fly like that, you know. Herb sure. Dean is definitely one of them. Uh, Big John, of course, is one of them. You're one of them. Um those are the only three I could really think of that I would be like. Those are title fight guys. I, I think I think uh, Jason Herzog is 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 so underrated. I think he's I don't even think he's under. I think he's 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 phenomenal. Jason Herzog is one of the, my opinion, one of the best referees that's out there. He's just very low key. He makes great decisions. He's a triathlete. Mm -hmm. He's he's a he's a black belt in jujitsu. The guy is a PT machine and trains like no like nobody's business. Um, Mark Goddard, I think is another phenomenal referee as well, you know, uh, solid official. So there's, there's a, there's a lot out there that are, that I do, you know, you know, highly respect and, and there's, there's good guys out there. And, um, you know, uh, Mike Bell is an up and coming referee and he's, he's one of the best, probably one of the best upcoming judges you'll see out mm -hmm. there. He's, he's, he's very good. So there's a handful of guys, Jaron, um, from Canada, um, mm. my Canadian friend, he's good. He's solid. Yeah. You know, he's, he's a good guy. So there, there are a handful out there and it's just whatever commission assigns these, these officials to, to do, but they're all more than capable of handling, handling and doing it. But, uh, you know, but to be mentioned amongst those names is pretty cool. You know? Yeah, man. Well, you know, it's always nice to like, cause obviously, you know, you're going to know referees like the back of your hand because you're one. And I'm sure like, as anybody who is in their field wants to be good at their job, you're going to want to be able to emulate certain people's characteristics and be better and take note from other people. And I think that that's awesome that you can recognize those people and give them that shout out because I'm sure they 
they appreciate the hell out of it. You know, like, um, you know, it's funny because I think a lot of people in the industry, whether they're fighters, referees, judges, like anybody, uh, cut men, right? I think that they all like, they have their group of people that they highly respect in their field. And I think that that's what needs to happen is those people working together, collaborating, because it makes that's everything. It, it, it does. And even on our judging side, the guys that are, you know, they got a, such a tough job, man. Uh, Derek Cleary, you know, from, from, from Atlanta, Georgia, phenomenal judge. He's good. You know, uh, Chris Lee, he's out in Florida. He's in your neck of the woods, you know. So, um, you know, you got you got uh, you got a bunch of good guys everywhere, you know, that are solid. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of my neck of the woods, uh, there's a promotion down here. Uh, Josh Saman, before Josh Saman passed away, him and a, a dude named Mitchell Chamali, they opened up this thing called uh, Combat Night. And it started off as the amateurs. And um, Mitchell Chamali is a fucking workhorse. Like as a promoter, like I've met quite a few promoters from different uh, things and they were most nine times out of 10 were just huge douchebags. But uh, he like, I don't, did I ever tell you the story about the time I got hired to bodyguard a promoter? You told me that. Yeah. So oh, like yeah. just anybody else hasn't heard this, right? So I got <laughs> hired one time to bodyguard a promoter, right? At a fight. And I'm not going to say, cause it's no longer relevant. So I'm not going to like call the dude out like that. Cause his shit's closed down anyway. So I got hired to bodyguard this guy and it was me and three other dudes got hired to bodyguard this dude. And I was like, that's odd, but fuck it. You're going to pay me. So we go and we follow this guy around and he literally says no word to us the entire time. Like when we meet, the first thing that he says is the guy that introduced us. He goes, are these the guys? And he goes, yeah. He goes, okay. And then he just walks. And then our guy who followed, took us there. He was like, well, your job's to follow him. And I was like, all right, well, fuck it. So the guy doesn't say a word to us. We're talking six seven hours the guy says nothing and we're like two feet away from him. there are plenty of times where he's standing there by himself on his phone doesn't say shit right just an arrogant asshole and so we're just standing there shooting the shit with all of us right we're like i've never had to bodyguard a promoter before this is odd so then the all the fights go on everything goes off without a hitch everybody has a good time and then we find out why we have to bodyguard this promoter so we get taken to this back room and it's like a, it's a fairly big room but there's nothing in this room but a table and he goes, I want one of you guys at the door. He goes, both of you guys, I want you to stand by me. And so I stand by the door. Two other guys stand by the promoter. And then we let in a fighter and a coach. And those are the only two people allowed in this room. Fighter and coach come in the room. They go to this guy and they start talking. And the guy breaks off their payment. And it's all cash. So he breaks off the payment and he hands it to him in cash. And every fighter and every coach that came in, none of the payments were what they were supposed to be. None of them. Now I can get if there was like a little dispute over some gas money or some shit here and there. And he just broke off a couple right. more bucks, but everybody was complaining. And we're talking about a couple hundred dollars extra that was being missing. You know, it's like, well, you told me that I was going to get this. You told me I was going to get that. And these guys are getting mad. And I realized why we got hired to be a fucking bodyguard is because this guy's a shady piece of shit. And like, I'm sitting here watching them rip people off. And I'm like, I wouldn't help you. I don't know why you hired us. None of body in this room is going to stop them from beating your ass. Like you were just a big sleaze ball. And like, but this dude, uh, Mitchell is incredible. Great promotion. Uh, the fights always go out without a hitch. He, uh, he goes to each one of these guys studios and trains himself at all the fighter studios. Like that's incredible. He goes and meets these people. He runs this thing called the Saman foundation where they give, uh, these donations to these fighters who were trying to make a living, uh, to work their way up to be professional. Um, it's just a really good event down here in Florida. So. Uh, speaking of my neck of the woods, I just figured I'd, I'd try to keep the, the legit ones shouted out, you know? Right on, as you should, for sure. And really quick, bro. Hey, Rob, did you get paid? <laughs> did you get paid by that promoter or did you get shortchanged? I got shortchanged. <laughs> I got paid, but I did not get paid what was agreed upon. <laughs> so we were supposed to get paid $75. I thought I'd, throw that, I thought I'd throw that dig in there at you, dude. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> No, we were supposed to get paid $75 an hour. He wind up short changes to $50 an hour. What a nice guy. Yeah, what a fucking dick. <laughs> I wonder why his promotion shut down. <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah, for sure, dude. So let's, see. let's see what D says. He said, do you ever get lost in the moment when two super athletes are smashing each other, almost like an out-of-body experience? That's um, sometimes. I wouldn't say lost in the moment, but an appreciation – for what I'm seeing and the techniques being implemented um, and just like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. This is, this is awesome. 
you know, I would say that's, that's, you know, that's something to me is something so significant and, and probably one of the cooler things is to see these techniques, um, being performed in front of me or an amazing scramble or an amazing setup for a knockout or the agility of some of these athletes, especially some heavyweights like Fedor's footwork was phenomenal at his age, you know, and, and his tenure in the sport, dude, to see the way he moved around was like, wow, you know, that's Fedor, you know, uh, John, jo John Jones, his intelligence inside the cage is off the chart. He's, he, had, he's, he's an animal, you know, really, really impressive. So stuff like that. Um, I take a, I, 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 I take it in, you know, it's like, wow, this is cool. You know, that's something that I do do Like, wow, that's pretty cool. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a beautiful moment, especially like you have to be an, like, I think the judges have to probably be one of the better fighter analysts because you have to see what's about to happen as a judge or as a referee to understand how to keep these guys safe. Like when you see a guy who's about to get head kicked, you know, you're like, yep. He's about to get head kicked and like have to be there and be prepared kind of before the setup, the follow-up happens. That's, and that's, 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 that's <laughs> I, I agree. And that's, that's why we position ourselves in certain sides of fighters to, because what we see or maybe a better vantage point uh, as to what's to come, if we have to come in there and, and do a stoppage. So yeah, that's, that's something that that's part of the setup, you know? For now, sure. have you been? I'm sure you've been clipped before. You, what's like the hardest you've been hit trying to stop a fight? I've been hit before for sure. You know, I've been hit in the back of the head. Um, uh, you know, I've had fighters try to fight me. You know, that happens quite frequently, especially when they go out after a choke or they've been knocked out, but mainly after a choke. They don't, you know, when you're choked out, you don't know you go out, dude. You just, you wake up and you're still like, you know, I'm still in the, I'm still in the fight. You're in fight zone, you yeah. know, but uh, uh, I've been hit. I mean, I wouldn't say like, been to the point where I've been knocked out, but I, you know, I, I've, I've felt it a few times, you know, and, you know, I've seen some referees catch some nasty shots, man. Like if you just go on YouTube and type in referee knocked out, like mo I have to say though, most of the referees who get knocked out are knocked out because they're too goddamn close to the fighters. And like a, a wild haymaker would just come out of nowhere and clip the referee. And you're like, Oh shit. Yeah. Whoops. yeah. A little close. It, it, it happens. I mean, I did tear, I did tear my calf. Uh, in the cage, you know, I told you that when when uh, I was refereeing the Aaron Pico fight, Aaron Pico and Shane Kirsten, that was that was one that I tore my calf twice uh, in, in 41 seconds. That was that sucked, you know. That was nothing nice. So yeah, that, that sucks. That totally sucked, man. Yeah, but it happens, you know. Glad you got the other calf. <laughs> yeah, you got the other one, man. Go limp around with a flat tire, bro. You're fine. It's just going to mess up your golf swing. You're always going to be slicing. <laughs> uh, that's it, dude. I suck at golf anyway, so it didn't help my game. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe one day you'll get your calf messed up the other way, and then it'll improve your game. It'll just make it, you know. It'll, it'll, even offset, it. It'll offset it, man, for sure. <laughs> um, This is interesting. So Lloyd Willett said judges and referees should be drawn from a pool of former athletes in the given sport. Um, I thought that most referees and judges already were. Am I correct? Yeah, that's for that's that's that, that's correct. Most of the most of these um, referees and judges have um, an MMA background, jujitsu background. Um, California, for sure. Um, most states they do. Uh, even in Brazil, uh, the referees there are all black belts. So yes. in jujitsu, so to answer that question that's already current and it's it's kind of the trend i mean how, and, and it makes sense i mean how can you officiate a sport you don't train in yeah uh, and have yeah. Any, and have any kind of real credibility so you know what i'm especially, saying especially for jujitsu like if you don't know any jujitsu and you're looking at something like if you didn't know what you were looking at like you're setting yourself up for somebody to get seriously seriously hurt right like you gotta have some basic knowledge of like what an americana looks like what a kimura is going to do because that range of motion for your arm is only going to go so far and that setup might happen quick you know like all of a sudden right. they snatch it and start yanking man you got to stop it you got to know what you're looking at i agree no i agree you got another big one too he said uh sport karate and point karate have side refs that from different points of view, do you feel something like that should be utilized in MMA? No. Well, there you go. <laughs> and, too, too many people in there, too many opinions. Just leave the referee in there as it is. It's not yeah. karate. <laughs> true. Very much true. And uh, 
and karate and sport karate also are based on a point system um which they're the fighters typically break themselves like it's not i don't think that's usually yeah um this is a good one he said hi guys uh thanks rich uh clearly fighters show respect towards officials inside the octagon i think that's usually mostly true most fighters are fairly respectful to the guy that's going to save their life um but has there been any time you've experienced disrespect outside the octagon from a fighter um i would say 90 or higher percent of the athletes are gentlemen or true professionals including the ladies they're professionals and they're awesome but i've had some fighters that um, you know, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to make everybody happy. You're going to have winners. You're going to have losers. Some people take, um, winning and losing, you know, not as nicely as, as, as the other folks, you know? So I've had fighters where they, they thought I was completely wrong and, um, they weren't knocked out, um, or they weren't out. They were, I stopped it because they passed out and they weren't, they didn't know. And, <clears throat> uh, express their displeasure and and hey look man just watch the video watch it after you wake up and you know you're you got a clear head from that knockout and you yeah. watch it with your coach or watch it by yourself and be honest with yourself and and after you watch it and you process it it's been more often than not it's been my experience that a lot of the guys have come back and apologized goes you know what mike i'm sorry i was i was i was wrong uh, yeah. Or sorry if I was disrespectful with you. I know what you were doing, and it was an emotion. And hey, you brought. And I get it, dude. It's a, it's 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 just the way it is. And uh, but most of them actually have apologized and said, "Hey, I, I messed up, or I made a mistake, Rob, where I fucked up, I dropped the ball, and I I have to own it, and I've mm. apologized. And how how you got to be true with yourself, and that's credibility, man. It's like, hey, you know what I. Dude, I, 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 I really dropped the ball in this one. I, I could have done things different. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll own it if I drop the ball. And, and we're learning. And you, you, that's just the way it is. And we're going to make mistakes. But yeah. Well, I think that's how you grow. Like, there's no yeah. way for you to possibly get better if you think that you're always right. Like, it's, it's okay to be wrong as long as you admit fault, you know? Absolutely. Um, 100%. Michael Roach says, stop wearing those dumb hats. Look at Joe Rogan experience. No one wears hats like that. It's distracting overall good shit. Thanks for that last statement of overall good shit. But my name is not Joe Rogan and I'll wear whatever the fuck I want. So suck my ass. I'm going to keep wearing my hats. But thank you for the compliment at the end. <laughs> um, that's just how I feel. I am my own person. I am a unique butterfly. Yes, I'll you are. That. Yes, you are. <laughs> and I like the hat. <laughs> thank you. But you got a full head of hair, so rock the hair, fucker. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I, I got plenty of hair, man. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, somebody said, don't uh, don't speaking Picos, you'll get two-year ban from USADA. You know, the USADA, like, it's a very interesting thing because that, like, th that, them, them being thrown around has been happening a lot lately. Like, the USDA, ADA kind of comes around, like, whenever you start talking about the UFC, like, immediately they pop up. Like, um, recently, because of the John Jones thing, John Jones had a fight that was supposed to take place in Las Vegas. Um, and then, of course, he gets popped, um, which I'm pretty sure everybody saw that coming. Um, and then he gets popped. And then they, rather than accepting their decision, because of the amount of, that was found in his system. They were like, well, fuck you. Nobody else, all these other athletic commissions will let that ride. So they moved it to California. Um, so like, have you ever had to deal with the USADA yourself or is that something you kind the of hands athletic, off? The athletic commission deals with that. And, and that's, there's some, there's some inconsistencies with, with that, with that statement. Number one, um, with John Jones's testing, from what I understand, it was it was already it was already in the system and it's, it's kind of a complex system to understand you know and there's a whole lot of variables involved but uh, they, they could have made it they could have made it well by bringing it before the commission in nevada but they weren't available and they it just it just didn't unfold fortunately for the ufc california had already had an adjudication process they already had a hearing prior to this even happening just to clear him with california of what he did so when he tested he was clean Okay, and then when he tests sooner, right before the event, do the dehydration process and everything else, that's where that test came back reactive because of what was in his system from prior use before 
and mm. use um, uh, the, the the second time around when he got during with when he fought uh, uh, DC. So that came up reactive, but it was the same amount. So it was a consistency. So it didn't grow. It's already in his. It's already in his system. During the dehydr during the dehydration process, it was relevant. California already had an adjudication process. It was cleared. It showed that a he is clean. This is relevant, which is why it was brought to California. That's the real. That's the real skinny on it. So, um, you know, whether he's clean from here moving forward or after, that's up to Usada and 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 what they do with him. But as far as that event goes, he was clean. From yeah, what I understand. So, you know, I think that was a little bit more of like the I, I hate to say it this way, but it's how I feel. It seems like a little bit of a boy who cried wolf kind of thing, because he had been in so much. It, he had so many issues before that they just automatically kind of like seemed like they were kind of throwing the book at him a little bit because of his previous things. I don't think it would have been that big of a deal if he didn't have so many issues prior. Like that's just what it felt like. It felt like the media especially were just trying to rip him apart. And it's like, we all make mistakes. We all fuck up the man, like nobody's perfect, but like, it's almost like once you've gone down that path so many times, you know, it's like, well, it was just kind of under, like everybody just assumed like he's got to have it in his system. Well, you know what, for, for his sake, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's faced a disciplinary process already, you know, and hopefully he learns and, and he grows from this. And, uh, um, you know, he's had his run-ins already with, with situations that weren't beneficial to him. So hopefully he, he moves forward and, and grows up and he matures. Um, he's a phenomenal athlete. Um, man, he's an incredible fighter. He's a good kid, man. He just needs to grow up a little bit. And hopefully this, this rattled his cage and, and he puts his best best foot forward and he shows the world what he can do and and he follows through with what he says. Period. End of story. I hope so, man. Cause like to me, watching him is probably the equivalent of to me anyway, of like watching almost like Muhammad Ali in his prime. You're watching a legend just every day come into the ring and do incredible shit from like a fighter standpoint. When you watch him fight, he's so technical, I almost take notes. Like, oh, I like that setup. I, oh, man, I really like the way that he moved his hips there. I really like the subtleties in his movement. I really like the palette of techniques that he uses because he doesn't just stick with your standard jab, cross, round kick. You know, he's like pulling shit out the box that most people haven't even tried the ring before. It's really cool. Right. To watch. He's um, an incredible athlete, Rob. My God, we can talk about him all day long. He's just a phenomenal athlete. Um, I just hope that, honestly, man, I hope it was best for him in the sport and and mainly for his his quality of life and his 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 own well being that he stays on the path and and I pray for the guys uh, to make right sound decisions. To be honest with you, man, that's just it would be a tragedy if he would if he would go the a different direction. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely, I agree. So yeah, this is a fun. question that's a little bit more relaxed. He said, "How do you clean your beard? <laughs> like after the event? It's <laughs> a good question. Clean my beard after the event? Well, yeah. um, I wash it, man. <laughs> I, like, I use, take I use, the braids I, out. I did, I, yeah, you know, I, I do take the braids out twice a week and I condition it. Yeah, just like <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, you know, that's pretty much it. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a clean. You know, I'm kind of a clean freak, so I'm very, uh, yeah. um, um, you know, uh, I my hygiene's clean. Everything is clean about me, even though I look like a dirtbag, you know. But <laughs> I, 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 that's why I wear the long sleeves, you know, yeah. for so I don't have any, um, you know, bodily fluids, bloods or anything on my, on my, uh, on my, you know, touch my skin or what have you. But, yeah, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a clean freak. So when it comes down to my hygiene, I, I'm, I shower at least twice a day. So that's just kind of how I roll. One day you're going to have that Pantene pro V commercial. That's just it, brother. Glorious. That's it, brother. Um, the Costco special. <laughs> <laughs> Rich has another good question. He said, what is the weirdest thing you have experienced during a bout? He said, I recall fighters literally shit themselves in the octagon. And did you have to stop the fight as a result of the weird action and or occurrence? Wow. Um, yeah. A lot of some weird stuff has happened in there. Uh, fighters have thrown up during the, during the heat of, uh, you know, during their, their fight. Um, I've had that happen. Uh, probably like kind of like, one of the scarier moments was I had these, uh, I believe they were middleweights, but they were good sized, good sized dudes that flew out of the cage and they broke the lock. 
Oh and shit! Like the door. The door just went like wide open, man, and they broke the gate of the door, and they both of them flew out. Um, and uh, fortunately, they were able to kind of break their fall. It just land. They landed as safely as possible. But it could have been a nasty situation. Yeah, that's like what four or five feet elevated. It, it, it's it's up there, dude. I don't know how tall it is. It's at least three feet, you know. But yeah, dude, they went airborne, bro. And and uh, uh, there's nothing I could do because I was on the up opposite side of them. And they yeah. went in there. For, guy went in for a blast double, and he, they both went for a ride. Rob, they just flew out, man. And, that was um, that was scary because that just it just sucked. Fortunately, they came back. I stopped the bout, you know, and, uh, um, you know, they had to fix the cage and all that stuff. But it was a it was a fairly new cage. It just just the force and they might have been heavyweights. I don't remember. But I know they were big dudes. Like a heavyweight thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was a, it was just a nasty ass setup, blast double, beautifully set up. And the elevation went through and they both went through the door. And uh, that, that's happened a few times, though. I've seen that happen. So that's yeah. why you always check the door, man. You know, <laughs> somebody doesn't put the the pin in the door, and all of a sudden, whoop. <laughs> dude, just the simplest things. People drop the ball, man. Shit happens, man. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, let's see here. Uh, kind of the the question pool is kind of run up here. So um, I do have like a. I always like to ask this question. It's my favorite question to ask people. I've asked literally every guest I've ever had on the show because it's my favorite thing to talk about. So in the martial arts, a lot of people don't understand, but inside the dojo, inside people's studios, mm -hmm. there's a lot of weird shit that happens that might not necessarily be talked about unless you were inside the studio. So um, I usually like to hear people's stories from the dojo. If you had like one like thing that stuck out to you, a crazy moment, something interesting that happened or something odd that happened inside the dojo that people might not know that you've experienced. In my school, no, not, not, not really. Everything's, everybody's pretty, pretty cool for the most part. Um, obviously doing bell promotions for us, every school does things different. I think what might be, significant from one schools it may be different for others for us you get judo thrown you know they it's any kind of a throw or a takedown yeah. um but i've been to other belt promotions where you, you get you get beat down with a belt you won't run through a gauntlet um that sucks but it's just that's just that's probably one of the quirkier things i've seen but our school that's what that's what we do but you know we still it's very traditional we bow before we get on the mat bow before we get off um but quirky things that i've seen or done in there or, or been around no other than other than what i've I told you before you know uh you wouldn't be a bro or, 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 a, or a or a good friend if you wouldn't go for the beard and start choking me with my own you know try to <laughs> that. that's probably something that you know he ain't your, he's not your first so i always give you my lapel i'll open it up here grab it leave this alone and somehow mysteriously fingers get stuck in there and and yeah, so um, has anybody choked you with your beard? No, no, no. <laughs> like, as soon as they grab it, you're like, "Yo, dude, hands off!" No, I tuck it in my I tuck it in my rash guard. So I grab oh, it. Oh, like okay. This, grab it. And I just tuck it in my rash guard, and it's kind of out of the way. So oh, that's cool. It really yeah, doesn't affect sense. it. So when you know, I'm, I'm rolling with you, I'll just I'll give you my lapel. It, it's better for me, so I can work the defense. And you got a deep, you know deep grip. So I'll give it to you and then we'll start from there. Yeah. Okay, if, you're, that makes if you're going, if yeah. you're going for it. So like that's, that's kind of interesting because you you're in a unique position because of your beard, because I know a, a lot of women when they roll because of their hair, they'll have to put it up in a very specific way to try to keep it out of the way. I never actually thought how you, I just assumed you just got to let it fly, but that would have to suck. Especially if you're rolling somebody like pops up, they get their knee like crushing your beard and you're trying to move your head, but you can't. Like, yeah, no, <laughs> man, it's, it's, it's just, it, it really doesn't get in the way to be honest with you. It, mm. it, it, it does. And that is like, that's wow. That shit must just must suck or it gets in the way or, or what have you. Not if you tuck it in your rash guard and, and, uh, um, I give you a lapel and it's really not that, it's really not that bad. You know, I, mm. I flow with it and, um, you know, other than other than a friend wouldn't be a friend if you wouldn't try to you know try to choke you with your own beard and we just have fun. <laughs> you know? Yeah, man, I can't do this long hair thing, dude. Like my uh, if my hair gets any longer than it is now, it drives me crazy. Like this is all you get. 
this is it. Like then again, I don't think genetically I was gifted with the ability to grow a beard like that. I think like this is probably the lo the longest it will ever get. But um, you know, I I don't know. It's it's that's a lot of dedication. To Dude, something. just just go big, Rob. Let it go. Find out. Oh shit. Let it go. <laughs> get past the pussy itchy stage and let it go. That's what you got to do, bro. That's it, man. Use right, Pantene, so. man. It, it works. Pantene. I'll just moisturize condition. That's it, you know? bro. There's, there's, there's beard oils, bro. You can rock it, man. You're good. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. What is what is today? Today is three two. So we're uh, March second. So I'll I won't touch the shit for three months. There you I'll go. Just, I'll leave the shit for three months and see what happens. Inner inner channel your your inner channel your your inner caveman. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. That shit out. That's it, bro. You'll be good. You'll be fine. You know, I kind of like being nerdy, unassuming. I, I I don't know. I like that shit because you you're a a big guy. You're like you're a fairly large man. You know, like you have the beard thing going for you, right? I think that that probably deters a lot of issues that you probably would have in your day to day life from people who might be douchebags. I kind of like the fact that I just kind of look like this nerdy, unassuming dude. Mm -hmm. It has helped me out. I think it's put me in as much trouble as it ever. It did help me out, but it always helped me out. Like we have a guy right now. Um, I love this kid to death, man. He's his name is Corey, and uh, he was a military vet. Um, you know, he saw some some really really rough things while he was out there. Um, it really it really put him through some some mental issues and some damage. He came back over to the states, and when he was back stateside, he immediately got married and. He's trying to get over like the PTSD stuff, which is very much an issue. Um, but he decided that MMA and jiu-jitsu was going to be his outlet to kind of work his way through the things that he saw. And I mean, the first time the kid saw me, um, I was I happened to be behind the desk because I work at the spot. And uh, he thought like, oh, this is the desk guy. So he kind of was a little bit of a dick to me, like just because he had that bravado. And uh, I was like, OK, cool. And then he got on the mat to warm up. So I got my gloves on. I changed into my uh, my stuff. I put my shorts on my rash guard and I was there for the striking program. And then it was like, oh, the desk guy's taking the class. And then I was like, all right, guys, let's go and line up. It was like, oh, the desk guy is teaching the class. And so I had him get started warming up or whatever. All right, guys, because it was a sparring day. I was like, all right, guys, go and partner up. We're going to do three minute rounds. And then, of course, I partner up with him because it's his first day and we're going to go nice and slow and work. Away. And he tries to rip my head off. He, I mean, he tried to hit me so fucking hard. And I just dropped him with a body shot. Wow. And he fell and he got back up. He tried to do it again. I was like, okay, drop him with a body shot again. I was like, let's, let's slow down. It doesn't need to be this way. And then, but after that, like the kid has been phenomenal. He's, he's going through fights now. He's got nothing but respect. He's like very cordial and respectful to people. I mean, it's a beautiful thing to see that kind of stuff. And I think that if I had been like a little bit more intimidating looking, I don't know if we would have ever had that moment, you know? Right. Oh, that's good. That's good, man. You know, some people oh. need that and some people learn the easy way or the hard way, man. You know, it's going to learn. It is what yeah, it is. Like, yeah, dude, I, I might look skinny, but I got these hands. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's funny you say that, Rob, because, you know, even with my son, Mikey, um, you know, he, he would get picked on a lot because he was a you know skinny little, you know, skinny looking, looking little white boy. And um, and uh, little did they know, you know, he was a he was a, a little land shark on the mat and and uh and a wrestler and and uh some people had to learn the hard way you know and and, yeah, and, and i've seen that footage like uh some of the footage of your your son wrestling and stuff like you got to be proud as shit of that man because the kid's an animal he's really good and that only comes from work ethic you can't get that from natural talent you have to work hard for that shit he's a good kid and and uh you know um he's a disciplined kid and he's, he's still a kid you know he's a, a kid's a kid but um you know i'm blessed and i'm fortunate he's uh he, he he listens most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, he's, he's, he uh, did he wind up getting like a scholarship for Matt wrestling? He well, we're waiting on um, the acceptance for him either for either West Point or Naval Academy. So, you know, hopefully here he's he wants to serve our country, and you know, my house is very patriotic. So, for he was raised, but my opinion, he was raised right. You know, honor the flag, <laughs> and. Um, you know, stand up for the national anthem and so forth and so on. I, I feel real strongly about that, but but um, for the most part, uh, he wants to serve. So uh, whether it's army or marines, I you know he, he'll 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 be an asset to wherever he goes. So and he'll get to wrestle. So that's 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 important to him. 
That's cool. You know, like I think that that's an important thing to me as well. Like, you know, when I was raised, um, we pledged pledge of allegiance was standard. You know, we got up. We uh, we it took two seconds to say that you were loyal to where you were from, um, yeah. to say that you respected it. You know, I always think about like World War II and like all the men and women who decided that they were going to get up like back then more men than women, but they were going to serve the country and they were going to go out there and risk their life to make things a little bit better. And that allows us some of the freedoms that we have. And I just never understood like anybody who would disrespect that. Like these people put their lives on the line so we can do what we do. Um, whether you and whether whatever your political views are, the truth is now this is just a fucking fact is that everybody is anti-violence until it's time to be violent. And then they hire a violent person to do the job. So you need people like that in the world. You need these people on your side. You don't need trained killers on the other side. What you need is somebody who you can back and go, you know what? I might not understand you, but I respect you. I might not understand why you do what you do, but I fucking respect the fact that you do it because you allow me to exist in a peaceful world because you are violent. You know, like it's, it's necessary. Violent men in this world are necessity to keep people safe. Because if you don't, if good people don't, aren't trained and skilled in violence, bad people will be. And you, you're going to need to be able to call on that. You could be as, you could be as peaceful as you fucking want to be. But I guarantee you when somebody's busting in your house or somebody's trying to rob you or somebody's trying to fight you and you don't know what you're doing, that mentality of peace all the time goes out the fucking window and you realize that you were wrong. You were just simply wrong, you know? I agree. So, this is my opinion. You know, that's a, that's another chapter. That's another, that's another segment, but uh, yeah, I agree. I yeah. agree. Um, one last one real fast and then we'll, uh, we'll get you out of here, dude. I appreciate you. So Rich, one more time. Thank you, Rich, by the way. Rich has been interacting a lot. You the man, Rich. Uh, he says, have you had moments in the octagon where you've watched a fight or a particular fighter and thought, what the fuck? <laughs> How or why are you a fighter? Maybe thinking to yourself, you could do a better job. Like, uh, I guess he's talking about fighters who may not necessarily belong in the cage. Um, yeah, that's why there's an amp. There's, there's the amateur, um, uh, program and, uh, in California, for example, camo, um, fortunately our camo, our amateur fighters are, are really high level kids. A lot of them are, um, that's how much the sports evolved number one, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, I've seen some fighters that I'm like, Whoa, what are you doing? And this is, this is, and I do have an answer that this is something that you have to find out for yourself if this is truly what you want to do as your chosen profession. And as a part of that is taking damage and I'm going to let you take damage. I'm going to let you get hurt until I know you can't tell you defend yourself. Then I'll pull you off there. If there's a nightmare occurring and you want it to go away, I'm going to make it go away, but I'll pull you out when I need to pull you out. And that's when you sit back and realize this is not for me. And it just positively reaffirms everything I was thinking such as uh, what Rich said. And, uh, you know, but that's not for me to tell a fighter, this is not for you. Just something, hey, you know, um, practice a little harder. You don't want to break somebody's spirit either because they can come back stronger. So, mm -hmm. but it's up to them to do some soul searching, decide if that's what they want to do or not. But yeah, I have seen that. Yeah, man, there's a kid in Jacksonville. I think he stopped fighting. He was on the amateur circuit, which I'm glad it was amateurs and not pros, but he was on the amateur circuit and he was 0 and 6. And he just kept going back in. And every time he went back in, I don't know why he did it. Maybe he just wanted one win, just one. I don't know. But every time he'd go back in, he was one of those guys, I guess you could say, that in the gym was good, very good. But as soon as he got into the, the ring cage, he folded. Right. He just could not mentally process the stress. Yeah, and what uh, happens. Yeah, it's, it's a shame because, like, I think if I remember correctly, there was a documentary I saw about GSP and his camp when he was getting ready for a fight. And one of the guys in GSP's camp is very similar to that, where in the gym is just like the best guy to work with, best training partner, very talented, very skilled. But he just something doesn't click when he gets into the ring or cage. And I think it, probably adrenaline has a lot to do with that. Like a lot of people can't process adrenaline well, um, like. Um, it just, they, their whole mentality changes. I've seen it happen with a lot of fighters, but I think that it sucks because you, you really want to see these guys succeed, but at the same time, like, sorry, you just can't cut it. You yeah, know? I agree. Yeah, for sure. 
It's a shame. I hate to see that happen. Uh, we're getting some compliments. I'm just going to soak those in real fast. D says, thanks for the time. You guys are excellent. You're welcome. <laughs> um, Rich, thanks, guys, from Wales, all the way from the UK. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate you for interacting. And then Dan, great interview. Keep up the great work, Mike. So that Thank one's guys. appreciate it. Um, so real fast before we head out of here, brother, um, let people know how to find you, where to follow you, what you're going to be doing next. Hit them with the skinny about uh, yourself. Well, um, you guys follow me at uh, Instagram, uh, referee Mike Beltran. Same thing on uh, Facebook and uh, at ref Mike Beltran at uh, um, Twitter. So um, I'm pretty active on Instagram for the most part, but you guys hit me up or whatever. You guys have any questions and uh, um, I appreciate you guys' time. And uh, I have a couple of Bellator events coming up. The schedule's filling up. So I'm in, I'm in beautiful Green Bay, Wisconsin uh, here for King of the Cage uh, tonight. And so getting ready for that show right now, I'm getting my bunch of text messages regarding that. I got to be downstairs here soon. So, um, but um, that's what I got going on. And uh, um, I appreciate you guys is giving me the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you. I know me and you, I think we've been talking about doing this interview for like two years or something like that. <laughs> yeah, we've been <laughs> so, for a while. Yeah, man. Uh, but always walk, you're always welcome to my house. You know that, bro. So Yeah, of course, man. Next time I'm in, I'm in LA. Yeah, next time I'm in LA. Um, I should be in LA probably soon because I'm working on that documentary. Yeah. So I'll have to go there uh, to Fresno. But like I've had a couple people that I, I've been meaning to meet and talk to and hang out with anyway, especially like I, it'd be cool to like go with you. Me and you were supposed to fucking roll at Kenny Ro uh, Florian's spot, but the damn plane, damn you plane. So the yeah. next time I get out there, we're going to go roll at a spot and then fucking sure. Peru. <laughs> we got to take Kenny with us, man. He'll go. Yes, dude. We'll, we'll drag him out. All right. Well, I will catch you later, brother. You got